Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. Hi there and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. It's so great to have you today. Thanks for tuning in for our worship service here. My name is Michael Cromwell and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here. And it's my honor uh, to be able to share with you today on this first Sunday of Advent. So let's pray together. God, we thank you for the gift of this day and your love for us that's so evident in the world around us. We pray, God, that you would, um, you would speak to us today. May May the words that you have to share truly ring in our ears and our hearts, and may we live them out in our lives. And God, specifically, I pray for more of you and for less of me. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, like I mentioned, today's the first Sunday of Advent. And you know, Advent is actually the first season in the church calendar, in the liturgical year. So this is kind of like New Year's for us as we start a new church calendar together. You know, I love this season of the year too. I, I love the sights of Advent and Christmas with, with lights and displays and everything, the trees, everything that we see. I, I love the sounds of this season too, when we sing carols that uh, bring such joy to us. I, I even love the smells of this season as we cook and prepare for family and friends gathering. And I love the fact that oftentimes there's just a feeling of warmth in the air. Even on the coldest of days, there can be a sense of, of warmth as well. It really is a wonderful season of the year for so many people. And a lot of people want to rush right into Christmas uh, to get to that rather than the waiting and the anticipation that comes about through this season of Advent. Um, it gives us an opportunity to, to search within, to prepare ourselves for Christ, for the coming of Christ. And that's what we get to do during this season. I, I want to encourage you to, to, to be a part of our Advent series as we walk each Sunday leading up to Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. I hope that you'll tune in and join us and, and be a part of what we do as we wait and anticipate what God's going to do in our lives. Well, our, our scripture lesson this morning comes to us from Galatians chapter 4 verses 4 through 7. Hear these words from the Apostle Paul. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. And we give thanks to the reading of God's most holy word. You know, I was reminded of a story that a, a grandfather approached his grandson's Little League baseball game one afternoon. After arriving late to the game, the, the grandfather went to his grandson who was sitting in the dugout, and the grandfather asked his grandson, he said, what's the score? And the boy responded, 18 to nothing. We're behind. Well, 
grandson, the, the grandfather said, he said, I, I, I bet you're discouraged by this score. And the boy replied, well, why should I be discouraged? We haven't even gotten up to bat yet. Well, it reminds me that there's hope. We, we, we need hope in our world today. Um, even though times and things can be so discouraging, there's always hope. Our scripture passage today, it's, it's a powerful passage for you and for me. Now, it may not seem like it on the surface when we first glance at it, but as we dive into this passage, we find incredible hope. Verse 5 says, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. This verse clearly states that, that God went to drastic measures to prove his love for us by sending his son Jesus in human form, born of a woman, as a Jew, subject to the law. You know, in the message version of the Bible, John 14 verse 1 puts it this way, and I love it. It says, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Christ came into our neighborhood to, to be one of us because God went to extreme lengths to prove his love. This passage, it's full of hope. And here's why. Jesus was born a Jew into a Jewish culture that he might truly fulfill the law. And the law was something that Jewish people knew really well. Following specific commandments, certain festivals, uh, making sacrifices, and a variety of other things. But he, even Paul, he says that, that some are slaves to the law and unhealthy strict obedience to the law. But Paul is using a legal example in this passage. Thinking that they could be saved by the law, some ended up being slaves of the law, trying to keep the law, and failing time and time again. You know, before Christ came, Jews and Gentiles were under the power and the authority of others. But after Christ came, Believers were no longer considered slaves to the law, nor were they considered slaves to those who govern the law, but they were heirs of God, allowing us to call God Abba, Father, Dad, and an intimate greeting that we have. You know, under the Roman law, adopted children were granted all legal rights to their father's property. Even if that person was a slave before, if they were adopted into the family, they were awarded all legal rights into that family, into the property. And even if a child was adopted, that child was seen as equal to all the biological children as a part of that family. So we now share with Jesus, who is God's own son, we now have all the rights to the Heavenly Father and all of the resources that God has for us. We are now heirs of God and can be fully obedient as God's children and identified as God's children. You see, because of Jesus, there's no more sacrificing of animals at the altar because Jesus himself became the ultimate sacrifice on the cross. Not, not only for Jewish people, but for the rest of the world as, as well. We no longer have to be slaves to sin because we're free because of Jesus. You see, although Jesus was born into a Jewish culture, his life, his, his ministry, and his sacrifice is for every single person. You know, God sent Jesus to buy freedom for us, us who are slaves to the law, slaves to sin, so that we might be adopted as God's own children. You know, no matter your background, Jesus came to the earth for you and for me, that we might be adopted into God's family. We, we are now God's heirs, God's beloved children. And it's not because anything that we've done, it's because who God is. And it's because what Jesus has done to prove God's love for us. You know, sometimes, 
sometimes we're guilty of trying to make the world smaller than it really is. And, and here's what I mean by that. At times, it could be easy to think that God loves me and people who are most like me the most. You know, people that have the same background as me, people who look like me, people who think like me, people who are a part of my political party, people who think the same way about theological issues as me, and the list goes on and on. But it's dangerous to think that God might love us more than any other person who might be different than us. Jesus came for the Jew and the Gentile. Jesus' love is, it's not reserved for just one political party. It's not reserved for just one denomination, and it's not reserved for just one group of people. You know, I don't know about you, but I, I can't get enough of those political ads that have been on TV the past month. <laughs> I, I don't know, but I, I feel like we've seen enough of those to last a lifetime. The, the pointing of fingers, the blaming of different things. We see, we see protests around our country, and it's, there's nothing wrong with that, uh, to stand up what you believe in. But are we, seeing, are we seeing people pour out love and compassion for others who might be different than them? You know, our own denomination is in a discernment period right now, trying to decide who we're going to be and, and how we're going to look. I, I don't know how things are going to end up at the end, but I know at the end, I know who I'm going to worship. You see, God is the same. God does not change. God will remain faithful, steadfast, and loving no matter our beliefs. Jesus came to, to offer hope. Hope to those who believe in God and hope to those who don't believe in God yet. Hope is something we all need. You know, before you and I accepted Jesus as our Savior, we needed hope. We still need hope. The whole world needs hope right now. In Parade Magazine, there there was a story uh, a while ago about a, a self-made millionaire by the name of Eugene Lang. And he had an opportunity to speak before 59 sixth graders at a school in East Harlem. You know, what, what in the world would he be able to say as a, as a white man, what would he be able to say to a class who was predominantly black and, and also Puerto Rican? What, what could he do to inspire them and, and to, to speak into them? As he got up to speak, he decided to, to scrap all of his notes. And he decided to speak from his heart. And this is what he said. He said, stay in school and I'll help pay the college tuition for every one of you. <laughs> you know, at that moment, the lives of these students changed for many, for the first time, they had hope. One student said this, I had something to look forward to, something waiting for me. It was a golden feeling. Nearly 90% of that class went on to graduate high school. And many of them went to college. And Lang fulfilled his promise and helped to pay for their college tuition. In fact, he even set up a foundation that one of the times uh, was recorded that he's helped over 18,000 students attend college who might not otherwise have the opportunity to do so. You see, these students, well, they needed hope. And so do we. And so does the entire world. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 23 says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. God's faithfulness has been proven time and time again. This season of Advent reminds us that God fulfilled his promise of sending us a Savior. It, it may have looked different than we had imagined, but God was faithful in keeping his promise. You know, one of my favorite images of Jesus in the Scripture is the image of light. John chapter 8 verse 12 says, When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. 
Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Those words of Jesus, I am the light of the world. Jesus entered into a dark world. And what the world needed and still needs is a light. A light that provides hope. You know, darkness can be a scary thing. The darkness is full of the unknown. And we don't like being in an environment where we don't know what's out there. I remember one of the first times I ever visited a, a, a large cavern. I remember we were going on a, a tour. We had a guide that was leading us through this huge cavern. And at one point along the tour, our guide told us to, to turn off our flashlights and see what happened. So we all turned our flashlights off. It was pitch black. I, I, I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. You know, what what should have been a terrifying moment, it, it wasn't. And as I reflect back on that, of thinking, why wasn't that very scary in that moment? I realized that I had a guide, a, a guide who had, had been this way before and that was leading us through. I, I had full confidence in him because he had led us up to that point and I knew he was going to see us through because of his experience in that cavern. You know, in the darkness of our world, we have a guide that knows the way. His name is Jesus. In fact, Jesus is the way, is the truth, and is the life. But even when we know the way, darkness can make it really difficult to navigate. I remember one time in one of the churches that I served, I was finishing up late one night, and it was really dark, and I was walking through the sanctuary and didn't feel that I really needed to turn the light on, but I was walking across the chancel area where the pulpit was and chairs and various other things, and lo and behold, my big toe made contact with the baptismal font. <laughs> I tripped over it, and I broke my big toe. You see, I I had walked that path hundreds of times. I felt that I knew the way and I did not need the, the light. But even being familiar with that space, I realized I needed the light to keep me from getting hurt, to provide the way for me. You know, one of the most significant symbols during this season of Advent and Christmas is light. And it's amazing how one light can pierce the darkness. You know, we have Advent candles around a wreath because they remind us that Christ entered into the world to offer hope, peace, joy, and love. And in order to have all of those things, Christ must be in the center of all that we do and all that we say. In his book, Presence and Encounter, David Benner shares a story about Sigmund Freud. Freud tells the story of a, a three-year-old boy that was crying out in a dark room of a house that he happened to be visiting one evening. And the boy cried out for his aunt, who happened to be down the hallway. And he said, aunt, aunt, talk to me. I'm frightened because it's too dark in here. Well, his aunt answered him from another room and she said, well, what good would that do? You can't see me. Well, that doesn't matter, replied the boy. When you talk, it gets light. You, you see, this child wasn't necessarily afraid of the dark. He was afraid of the absence of someone that he loved. And what we need in order to feel secure today is God's presence. It is the presence of God in our midst. These words that Jesus speak, I am the light of the world, it's more than just an image. It's Christ promising and providing a light for us in the dark and in a hurting world. And it reminds us that Christ is present with us. One of the most often repeated promises in the Bible is God saying, I will be with you. But in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus turns the table on this image of light. He says these words. This is Jesus talking to his followers. 
Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. He says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. See, yes, Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus became God present for us all. We no longer have to wonder what what God is like. We no longer have to wonder how God acts and, and how God speaks. We know because of Jesus, because of Emmanuel, which means God with us. And we know that we're never alone because of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And just like this, this boy that, that Freud talks about crying out to his aunt in the darkness and desiring her presence, God wants to use you and me to be his presence in the world today, to offer hope to everyone. You know, as the body of Christ now, we are called to be the light in the world, the light of Christ in the world today. It's our turn to offer hope to a hurting and a desperate world. So, what does hope look like today? Have you ever thought about that? In our world today, what does hope look like? Well, I I know it could take the shape and the form of a lot of things, but I, I want to sh- share with you that, um, and suggest that perhaps hope looks and sounds like an invitation. How will you and I offer hope to the world through our words, through our actions, and through invitation? There are so many opportunities right now in this season of Advent and Christmas to invite others uh, to, to be a part and see what God is doing, whether it's inviting them to watch online and to, to see and to view our, our Advent sermon series. It could be to, to be a part of our children's ministry and youth ministry, to, to come to the Christmas concerts, to be a part of our Christmas Eve services and Christmas Day service. There's a whole lot of opportunities. So how, how will we offer hope to those around us? By inviting them to experience what true hope looks like, what true hope sounds like, and what true hope feels like. Hope. It it might only have four letters, but it's a huge word. And it's something we all need, especially these days. You know, God offers hope to a sinful and a lost world. And He offers hope through His Son, Jesus Christ. No matter how dark our circumstances may be, there's always hope. And there's always hope because there's always God. God always has been and God always will be. No, we only see and know so much. But God sent His Son so that we might be filled with hope. Including the fact that there's more to this life than we see and know. Jesus came to offer the world hope. And now, it's our turn to offer hope. And it's nothing that you and I have to offer, really. But it's the one that we've put our hope and our trust in. And we offer that hope to others. So, as we look to the true light, let's shine out our lights this Advent and Christmas season, and let's help point others to Jesus.
Let's pray. God, we thank you that you have given us hope. Hope in the form of a baby who would eventually grow and live an incredible life, have an incredible ministry, all for the purpose of going to the cross so that we may not be slaves to the law or slaves to sin anymore, but we might be free, free to call you Lord and free to to have our being in you, to, to be called children of yours. God, we thank you for the hope that has been given to us. And we thank you that even in a dark and a scary world, there is still hope. And God, we are humbled that you would allow us to be a part of bringing hope to others. So shine your light in us and shine your light through us, God, that we might truly offer those around us true hope as we invite them to be a part of what you are doing, as we invite them to, to take part and to see that there is hope in the world today. Because God, you are God. And you have sent your son Jesus as Emmanuel, God with us. So fill us with your spirit that we might follow you, be obedient to you, and shine your light in this world. We love you and we praise you. In all this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, Just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, Thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. We believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image, and what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our, When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.